Welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Ivick and I'm the Content Marketing Manager here at eLearning Brothers. We have a great panel of speakers for today's Lectura Live, but first I'll go over a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and we'll email a copy of the recording out to everyone who has registered. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to use the questions panel to submit them to us. We will get to as many as we can during this webinar, and if we run out of time, we will do our best to follow up offline afterwards. If you haven't done so already, please check out the Rockstars community. It's a great place to connect with other e-learning developers, lectura users, and ask questions. Joining me today are Chris Willis, Director of Product for Lectora, John Holland, our Customer Success representative, and we have two special guests today. Chris Paxton McMillan, president of D3 Training Solutions, and Christine O'Malley, president of eLearning Designs. Chris Paxton has almost 30 years of experience in training and development and volunteers with the Electora Accessibility User Group. Christine O'Malley is the founder of that awesome group and an expert in developing accessible learning in Electora. So without further ado, Chris, I'm going to turn the time over to you and we can get started talking about the wonders of accessibility in Lectora. So All that right. would be, um, so Chris, Chris Paxton, you're going to key up those slides. I think it's wonderful when we do a Lectora Live and we have three accessibility Center folks, well, actually two experts and 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 one dabbler, um, and <laughs> I'll call myself an accessibility. And we all happen to be named Chris. So, um, but uh, yeah, there we go, Chris. So go ahead and and, and we're going to launch. We're going to start with this poll here, and what we want to know is so we can help tailor this presentation and experience to your needs. If you could just click on the team and let us know what is your relationship right now with building accessible learning are you curious at the curious stage you're here to learn more are you actively working um, especially in a compliance uh, area in accessibility is it uh, one of these uh, situations where it's not required that you develop for accessibility but you know accessibility matters and you want to do better or other and in this forum please use the questions panel and send us your questions or comments. All right, Chris, so we've got the answers coming in. We'll give just about a couple more seconds to let people finish. But right now, we've got um, over half are actively working on compliance requirements. So that is awesome to see. I'll give it just one more second, and then we'll close the poll. I'm seeing an awesome comment here from Thomas who says that he's super familiar with accessibility and wants to take it to the highest level possible. That's that's amazing, Thomas. Thank you for that. Actively working on compliance. We have a lot of compliance folks here. And then we have a about equally split there between the curious and the not required and some of the other. All right, so thank you everyone for sharing that with us. And we will go back to you, three Chris's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and our next question is to understand a little bit more about your Lectora usage. Are you a Lectora expert? You've used Lectora, you're new to Lectora, you're curious, or again, other? All right, so we've got the poll on the screen there, so go ahead and click right on that. Early results coming in, we've got quite a mix of people who have varying levels of experience in Lectora. We'll give it about one more minute to make sure everyone has a chance to vote, and then I will share these results. All right, so let's put these up on the screen. So we've got some experts, some curious, some are dabbling in Lectora. 
nice range. Awesome. So yeah, we do. We have we have a wide mix of, of expertise here with with about uh, uh, let's see, do a quick math. It's about a split between those who are uh, on the expert end and and those who are newer or uh, curious and and just getting started. So. Um, Chris Paxton, I'm going to turn this over to you. Before I do that, I just want to say throughout this presentation, go ahead and keep entering your comments, questions, ideas, concerns uh, into the questions panel here. We'll be monitoring those live while uh, Chris presents. And, and Chris Paxton, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. Um, and this is one of the things uh, when we think about accessibility, it again involves obviously the creation of online learning. But the biggest thing is that we want as many people as possible to be able to participate in this amazing material that we're developing. And it's our responsibility to make sure that that knowledge is delivered clearly and concisely and truly available for everyone. And so that's really what we talk about. Uh, and think about when we are thinking about Lictor uh, and that development. And so that, again, those need to be, those courses need to develop to meet the needs of all the learners. And not just those with, you know, limitations or disabilities, um, but, you know, just with everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and, Christine, why don't you share when we think about accessibility, what it means? <laughs> So I think one of the things that I would probably add to that, Chris, is, um, you know, impairments. I like to call them impairments versus disabilities, first of all. Um, we, we all face them, and I think that I personally can testify the older I've gotten, the more issues I have, like, especially from a cognitive impairment issue. I used to be able to proof, read things very quickly and you know, just find one little thing I was looking for in passages and passages, and I could quickly get to that. And now, as I begin to get older, I don't have that ability anymore. So accessibility is something that is definitely helpful for everyone. Um, I think also we need to think about impairments that come along that are temporary. So if you've got someone who maybe in your office who does strictly keyboard work for you, what if they broke their wrist or broke their arm? So, um, and then Chris, I know you're gonna get into some more stuff that are things that should be considered, so I don't wanna go too far beyond that, mm -hmm. but it really is a way of communicating with people who are outside of our target audience. And we have to think about everyone and not just that one professional, you know, the knowledge that we're trying to teach them. We need to think about how can they consume this the way that they need to consume it and not how we want to give it to them. Okay. One of the questions we like to ask is, who do you visualize as having an impairment? And there's some interesting statistics oops, there is, uh, out there and that according to the National Eye Institute, one in 12 men are colorblind. So think about that number. How many men do you have within your company? According to the Centers for Disease Control uh, in the United States, approximately 20% of Americans have at least one disability. And according to the American Optometrist Association, beginning in the early to mid 40s, many adults start to have problems seeing clearly at close distances and especially when they are in front of a computer which so uh, so many of us are and this just gets worse between the ages of 41 to 60. so again think about how many employees you have total what's that 20 percent think about how many employees you have that are over 40. Right? and as you're thinking about those numbers we would like to ask you Thinking about that current workplace of yours, how many men work there? Again, statistically, one in 12 of them could be colorblind. How many total people do you have? What is 20% of that number? And how many workers are over the age of 40? 
and I'll give you guys a number and you can actually put that there in the chat as to what your count is. And again, obviously some of the numbers overlap, but we're hoping this is a great example that most companies should be thinking about accessibility. So yeah, please use the questions panel and uh, in your organization, just kind of the thumb in the wind, what would you say are the yep. number of people that may be affected um, that you're not even necessarily aware of with a non-obvious uh, need for assistive technology of some kind or for us to develop with accessibility in mind? Now, Chris, you know, this is a hard question to answer since you can't ask women what age they are. <laughs> Keep that secret. Well, I can tell you that I can tell you that as a woman of a certain age, that um, I know for a fact that as our eyes age, we need a greater proportion of light to enter our eyes in order to be able to see contrast. And um, I find that working with a lot of designers and engineers a lot of them uh, uh, or designers and web developers and designers a lot of them tend to be earlier career people and quite often they um they're taken aback when i come back and say i have trouble reading what you've you've presented to me here and it's because um I fall into one of those categories where I can't make out contrast the way that they can. So it looks perfectly fine to them. It looks perfectly fine to their peers that they've shown it to. And then it hits me and I've got to put the kibosh on it. So, Yeah, definitely. So we're getting some comments in the chat with a different uh, range of numbers. Some of the some interesting comments include my university would probably be over a thousand people to consider and that includes students so that could be quite a range of ages and then um, another attendee says as a freelancer they have a number of different clients and don't know a lot about their employees ages and things so yeah definitely some of us are designing e-learning and we don't know what disabilities the end user could have and that's where I know Christine and I have, have talked a lot about this is that so often we work with people and clients and they're like, well, we don't have anyone because they make an assumption of what that person may look like with an impairment. And there's so many more things. It's not necessarily something so obvious and it's things that we need to take into consideration. As developers, we can do that with some Pretty, just incorporate it into our everyday development and it just becomes second nature. So one of the first things that I would strongly encourage every developer out there to do is bookmark a couple pages. And the first one is, you know, again, when we think about 508 and we talk about it, where does this come from? Well, it's, it's actually section 508, it's part of a law and it is 50 guidelines all about electronic resources and IT information, uh, making that information accessible with those people with disabilities. And they're based upon these standards developed by the Web Accessibility Initiative, or WAI, which is what you'll see there at the beginning of the URL. And so I would really encourage you to bookmark the guidelines. There's the overall guidelines in the top portion that I have set up, and they, we've added it into the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, in addition to, there's a quick reference guide. Now the challenge can be is sometimes developers again want WCAG, they want it to spell out exactly, but you, know, you really need to be aware of what your audience is and, and what their needs are. Um, there are three different levels that we talk about and I'll explain what, more about when I say we talk about, and that is the A, the AA, and the AAA. But the WCAG actually says that for most of us, for developers, our goal should be just AA, okay? Um, the, let's see, I'm trying to read their exact quote so I don't misquote it, uh, but it is not recommended that level uh, AAA conformance be required for the general uh, policy for entire sites. 
because it's, it's not, just not possible to satisfy all level uh, AAA, AAA success criteria for some content. So our goal should really be that double A and um, understand how that works. And when we think about those and those 50 areas, they break it into four areas from there. There's the visual, the hearing, the motor, which we've kind of talked about. And so many times we just automatically think of visual. So our screen readers or people, again, who worn glasses pretty much since we were born. Uh, our hearing, what about those that are hearing impaired? Again, something else that increases as we get older. But again, it's also those, those motor and those cognitive. What happens if you break your arm? Well, when I was little and broke my arm and was in a cast for almost a year, I had a lot of issues there. Um, I didn't have to make any adjustments because there weren't computers around back then. But nowadays, what would that do? How would I have to adjust in dealing? Because this is where I work. I am at a computer almost all day. And many of us are. So one of the things in saying all of this, because there's a lot of information, we just can't cover it uh, again in this Hour, but we do want to invite all of you to join. We have a Lectora Accessibility User Group, or the LEUG, and this was established, it's been a while, around for a while, back in May of 2017. And the whole purpose of this group is for sharing questions, solutions, ideas of how to make our development and how to make all of our content accessible using e-learning and Lectora. And we meet virtually January through October. Um, Christina O'Malley, as we mentioned, is the founder and is absolutely wonderful. Um, you'll also note, though, within the Rockstar community with eLearning Brothers, there is an LAUG group, and this is how we can communicate and connect with each other between those monthly LAUG, uh, LAUG live discussions. And again, there's the link that we would encourage you to join to get on the distribution list. And Christine, would you like to add anything? No, I think that, you know, what I usually do is I send the link out maybe about a week or two before our meetings. Um, we get together the last Thursday of every month from January through October. The only reason we don't meet in November and December is because I didn't want to change the date that we meet. I think it's it's better if people have in their mind, oh, it's the last Thursday of the month, we meet with LAUG. So we have that constant um, set time. And obviously in the US, um, it's a conflict with holidays in November and December. And so that's why we don't meet at that time. Um, I will tell you that starting with the next meeting, which is gonna be the 30th, next Thursday, we meet from a 10, 10 o'clock to 11.15 Central. And um, we are going to start focusing on the WCAG guidelines. So we're going to go back to some basics about how to do some really foundational things that we need to do in our e-learning for accessibility. But then I also want to dig into the guidelines a little bit so that we can maybe better understand what those um, guidelines are telling us. Um, as I've now started to get into that level of accessibility, I think I've kind of stumbled upon some misinterpretations in how people interpret the guidelines. And I think what we want to do is really add some clarity there for folks. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I want to add um, to that. Just go to the website, um, the laug.org, fill out the form, and then when you do that, that gives me permission to add you to my distribution list, and then you'll receive my emails. And it's really not used for any other purpose in case people are concerned about privacy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I was going to add that part too. Thank you. Yeah. Questions or anything coming in so far? No, we are good right now. Okay. Okay. And let's go ahead and continue. Um, when we talk about WCAG, and I just kind of want to give an overview before we, we go into some of this. Again, there are the 50 guidelines. And in 2008, they kind of upgraded this. and put it into four principles or 14 guidelines into four principles that's often referred to as poor. 
And you may be wondering, what does that mean? Well, it means basically the areas that you're looking at, it's perceivable, operatable, understandable, and robust. So basically for perceivable, again, I've got the information there that the user interface components must be presentable to where, again, they can perceive it. They, they can see that it's there. Um, whoops, sorry, jumped ahead there. That was a little so, fast. Uh, again, this means, Chris, mm -hmm. I want to jump in there for a moment. Um, so Let's just see. to kind of give people an example, so perceivable, that something that might fall under that category is contrast. You know, um, under operable, you may have navigation, and it's like the skip link may be in there, okay? Understandable is going to get at resolving some cognitive issues, and then robust is going to get at as long as you're – your, what, your output is around, it needs to always be um, available to whoever's using it, okay? So that kind of gives you a little more definition around those. And I want to talk about that understandable a little bit more because so often we've, we've talked about some of these other impairments, but think about your audience too. Do you have some audience that may not be real comfortable either reading the English language or just reading in general. So there's all these things that we can do that can help so many other people. And it's just little things that we do that just makes a huge impact, a positive impact on so many others. When you're first starting Lectora, and most of you guys um, marked on there that, again, you were a Lectora user, so you should hopefully, or you may know this, but when you go into your project options, which is under the design setting, you can check a box, and I would encourage you, you'll hear me talk a lot uh, when I do teaching and different things, to create these things and create a template. Uh, templates and library objects are things that I use a lot, saving a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, and one of the things when I create a template, it is a living template. It is something that I will constantly redo and update. So when you name them, I always put the uh, date on it so I know which is the most recent one. But one of the things you want to do, and hopefully if again, it's in your template, you want to remember so much, is again to even have your project options set for web accessibility settings. There's several things that's going to happen when you do this. I've got them listed. Again, those language properties are now set up. This actually lets the screen reader know that a specific text block, uh, if needed, may be different from the default language. So maybe you're doing things in multiple languages or you're doing something and you're teaching another language. Uh, this may be, it, it lets it know how it needs to read it. Um, the custom radio buttons and checkboxes are disabled. The alt tags. Yes. Hey, Chris, excuse my interruption. Uh -huh. That second item, I'm not so sure about that. Um, custom radio buttons and checkboxes, they used to be a problem with Lectora, but I think in 21, and, and John Holland, you're on the call, um, right. it's it true that I, I think that the issues that we were having with uh, radio buttons and checkboxes has been resolved. I'm not 100% certain if that's if that's right that they're disabled. Okay. And we can definitely follow up on that offline. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say th those were resolved. Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> they were. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, those were resolved. Okay. Thank yep. you. We need to update that in the book too, uh, which is the other thing many of you guys may or may not be aware. Uh, Christine and I have just updated a new e-learning book uh, for um, the e-learning brothers. And so, Christy, we need to get that updated because that was uh, in the book too. So, yeah. Sorry, okay. didn't catch the sooner. No problem. Um, again, video and audio scans disabled, so you're going to have that default one. Um, rollover video controllers disabled. Again, you guys can can read what this does, but this will again, if you set it at the very beginning, it will help set you up in the rest of your development. So, um, visual. I don't, I don't want to actually read to everybody. So, Christine, I want to add something else to that, Chris. Um, when you mm -hmm. said when you do that in the beginning, I think that's key. 
um, I'm pretty sure this would still be true of Lectora 21, but let's say you were using Lectora 19 and you added custom radio buttons and then you went back and you checked this checkbox to use web accessibility settings. It's not going to catch the incorrect things that you did before, but mm -hmm. once you set it moving forward, it would alert you if you have um, always on top property set. You know, things like that. So it's from this point in time when you set it on is when it's going to catch things. Exactly. Which is another reason I love templates so that you don't necessarily have to remember to do this. And I just have it default on all of mine that it's set. So. You know, and then the, the, the reverse would be true. Let's say that you want to rely on the accessibility settings to um you know catch things like always on top all right and mm -hmm. say you're not in 21 and you want to catch you want to use it to catch it and then you know it's going to catch any custom radio buttons or you know you want to use custom radio buttons or check boxes you could go back and uncheck this and then put that feature in and then it's not it's not gonna, you're not going to be locked down completely from using some features but it's really important to know when you can and when you should and should not use them. So there's flexibility there. It's, it's not it's not going to completely control everything you're doing is I think the point I'm trying to make. Which is why we really encourage people to mark the WCAG website so again you understand the why behind it. So you know when you can and when you can't. Great example. Okay, then we'll kind of continue on a little bit. When we think about screen readers, because that is what, from my experience, most people just automatically think of is I've got to be able to do this for screen readers, but they don't understand how the screen readers work. A couple things to keep in mind is, and this is a picture of a the Project Explorer, formerly known as Title Explorer if you're using 19 or earlier. Uh, we they ch we ELB changed it to Project Explorer because again, it can do so much more than just e-learning courses. But a screen reader will identify items <clears throat> from the top to the bottom in looking, which is why I've got my arrow down there. Um, in some tools or online projects, you actually have to indicate um, how they are, but with look for it, it does it for you automatically, which can really save you some time. Um, it automatically knows, so you can see here's the T for the text block, it automatically knows that, well, that's a text block, so I'm going to go ahead and read whatever's in that text block, not necessarily reading from Project Explorer. If it sees the photo, it knows, well, that's not a photo. It's not anything for me to read, so I'm going to read whatever I put in my alt text or depending on how there's again, a lot going on here, uh, if maybe the file name. And, and this is something we talk about more, again, within the book and within the LAUG. Um, but this is, again, essential for things such as, again, the screen readers and stuff, because think about if that was something you're using, would you really want some of those consistent items at the top, such as their logo, such as the homepage, such as the next, as we can see on here, would you want those being read on every single page? Now, some people may think, oh, yeah, that's not a big deal, but if you were at that receiving end, and how annoying would that be? And how much would they be paying attention to your course because they're just being annoyed by having to listen to this? So you know, if we can make it easier for them, it's going to be easier for all of us and we're all going to learn more. Christine, is there something you want to add maybe? Yes, I do want to add something. Thank you, Chris. Screen readers. One of the things that, you know, after starting the user group and having many meetings, I think one of the things that was very, very encouraging for me to learn is that I don't have to be an expert at reading using a screen reader. I don't have to do that. As a lectora developer, what I need to know are the best practices of how I should structure my course, rely on the tools within Lectora, follow these best practices, and if I do that, 
And if I get my content ready for screen reader testing, that means that that can go to someone who is an expert at using a screen reader and then they read it and that experience that they have should go very smoothly as long as I do my part. Okay. Exactly. And I want to point out a couple of things. Historic years and years ago, again, been using Lictor. We both have been using Lictor for quite a while. Um, but they would say in order to, before you put a button, you'd put the word button or BTN. Again, this is not something you would want to do. And I still see people doing that because in that case, a screen reader is going to say button. And then in this case, it'd say home. And then afterwards, it's automatically going to put the word button there. So they would read your button, home, button. How annoying would that be? Or again, right. if there was the image, it would say, some again times they used to put the word image beforehand or photo or pic or something so in that case it would say image elb logo image okay so these are just some best practice things to keep in mind yep um okay um kind of the same is true when we think about keyboard navigation for those who are not able to use a mouse, they're truly dependent on just that keyboard. So when you're going through and testing, not only test, make sure your audio is working, make sure those are things, but put your, key, put your mouse aside and go through the class as you're testing before you, it actually goes to a trusted tester and, and run it, try it with your mouse, try it using the arrow keys, uh, try using those tab functions and see how well it works and if there's changes that need to be made because these are just some you know, simple things that can uh, help you make it again easier for them and a lot of these keyboard functionalities or keyboard navigations are the same as the windows tabbing functionality so your end users are used to using it and they want to use it here in the class too okay. Yeah, yeah. So whether you're screen, whether it's screen reader testing or keyboard navigation testing, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is the output that you want to test is an HTML publish at minimum. So you figure maybe you're putting on LMS, that form is going to be an HTML, but you could just simply publish mm -hmm. HTML and test that. What you don't want to do is test in run mode or test in preview mode with a screen reader. Um, I'm not sure how reliable keyboard navigation testing is in those modes, but I do know for a fact just from hearing and talking with screen reader experts is that you are going to get completely different results with run mode and preview mode testing with a screen reader. So you definitely want to publish an HTML output. Uh, you know, test that. Okay. And I have a lot of people when we do training, they wonder why we actually just have that HTML because they're not publishing maybe for a website. And it's like that can save you some time versus publishing to your SCORM, loading it to your LMS, testing it there. You can just publish the HTML, test it on your computer. And again, it just saves you time. And again, time is important for all of us. Uh, one of the nice things that uh, is with this too, when you have your uh, setup for web accessibility, and I've, I've got that as a bottom icon here, is you can actually set up groups. So like in this particular case, I've got this back and next group together. I could actually go through and have that set as reading order for last because my back and my next button are usually going to be at the bottom. It's the last thing I want them to read. Uh, so you can do that actually with a group. And that's only going to be available at the project level. It's right. a group, not a group. Yes. Okay. Another um, tool to help you in your developing, so as you're processing and you're designing, you can take advantage of the Lectora Accessibility Check Tool. This can be run anytime during development. And it is just designed to help you catch elements that Lectora says you that may not work. Uh, this is handy. Chris and I have talked about this in that we 
you know, use it if we're trying to test something out, like it's a, a new project, a new game, a new activity, to see if it is accessibility, we'll run it through the accessibility checker. And what it's going to do is just let us know if it needs more attention, okay? I, we always want to do disclaimers for all of this, though, in that the tool should not be used as, again, that final indicator of whether or not your project's gonna be 508, because a lot of that's gonna come from, again, what your company needs, um, what your audience needs, and no automatic tool out there can accomplish really what a person is going to do with manual testing. So it's something that you're going to want and need to do too, but this can save you a lot of time in your learning process on trying to figure out what is accessible and what isn't, and try to go through and fix it. Fix it. I've always, one of the things I love about being a developer is if something goes wrong, I feel like I'm a detective and I get to kind of figure out what's wrong and, and to make it work right. Uh, and that's my nerdy self uh, without having to, you know, go into law enforcement and mess with the really yucky stuff. I get to do it this way. So. Okay. Christine. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, again, it's a third party tool. Treat it as a third party tool, um, as any other third party accessibility tool. The real testing comes from the screen reader testing, the keyboard testing, any other devices that might be true for your audience. That's where the real confirmation is going to come in place as to whether or not it's accessible. This is all helping you get to that point where that testing process goes smoother. Okay. And one of the last things, and I say this all the time when we're doing training classes, when we do anything, is one of the best things about Lectora is the ability to not only set up templates, uh, which is great, and I've got the picture, so once you go through here, you do file, save as, save as a template. Uh, I would encourage you, once you save it, again, I haven't noticed a limit on my on my names for when I'm saving my template. So, be as descriptive as you possibly can. And I always put a date on it. So I, we deal with a lot of different clients. So I almost always start out with my company name. When I worked for one particular company in general, I would put their department because certain departments wanted certain things a certain way. Uh, and then I would put kind of what the file, you know, is this with a quiz? This is not with a quiz and here's what the date. And know that it's kind of a living thing that has I go through and become better and add more stuff to it. I can always make changes and additions to it. I think I currently have probably 30 different templates on my Lectora right now uh, that kind of actively, semi-actively working with. The other thing that you can do is create a library object. And I cannot speak enough about library objects. Library objects are great because if it's something you get to working a certain way, I don't want to have to remember, well, wait, what class was it that we did that in, that I built it? Okay, let me go pull it up and copy it. Okay, now I'm going to paste it in here. I can right-click on some text, uh, some actions, a page, a chapter, actually even a whole course if I wanted, and I can right-click and I can save that as a library object. Then again, the naming of it's important so you can remember, wait, what was that library object for? But library objects can save you so much time especially as we're dealing with accessible and everything else to save you time. And I once had a manager tell me we write things down so we can forget because we get older, we're not going to remember as much. This gives us that ability to not necessarily remember how I did it, but it's still there. And all these things can be redefined as you go and made available again to your team. Christine. Well, um, you know, you made me think, I think another creative way to use library objects is, you know, if you're an independent consultant like you and I are, then if you have clients and they want to know what you can do from an accessibility perspective, you could have things that you've created and save them as library objects. And it's a very quick way to get to them and share them and show them what you've got. So, yeah, use it, use it to your advantage. Exactly. Because so much of what you create, if you're independent contractors, you know, we've got NDAs, we've got to honor, so, but that way you can still show and share. Mm -hmm. okay. Questions? Thoughts, comments? 
So I just wanted to on the uh, on the to add to what you're saying about library objects. This ability to save any single slide, single part of a slide or, or lesson, a whole course or any any portion of a course as your own template. This is part of the very unique that this and inheritance are two of the very unique things that are built into Lectora that make Lectora um, it, it, sometimes an unusual paradigm for people who are new to Lectora. But once you grasp the power of these things, you're, you know, it just opens up so many doors. So our mod dev system is really based on in, in large part on library objects. And once you work with those, because they're built in Lectora, you're basically working with a set of macro and micro templates that once you customize them and you test them and you know they're accessible and you know they work for you, you now have these building blocks that you can mix and match and put together. Um, and it, it's, it is such an amazingly powerful thing. So I can't underscore the value of library objects enough. Um, I, I just think they're automagical. They're just, just some kind of, of, of really incredible thing. Um, there's a lot of things in e-learning. I don't think people often think about how many repetitive things we do where we create from one course to the next a sequence and in every course in our library we follow that exact same sequence the words are different the images are different but the logical sequence is exactly the same and you can set that up as a library object once you crack that code so anyway, I'm I'm on the verge of maybe I'm past the verge of rambling, but I, I'll turn it back over to you. But I just had to give a shout out for the magic of library objects. I'm I'm right there. I um I again the biggest challenge is making sure you name it so you recognize how you. I mean it can be a piece of JavaScript. Um, we yes. worked when I worked again for this company. They wanted it. It, it took months months. To get through what verbiage we wanted at the very beginning to say there's audio but please listen to your headsets but not have it too loud to disturb your it had to go all the way up to a vp well i didn't want to have to worry about but not every class had audio so i didn't want to put it in the template so i saved the verbiage itself has a text block has a library object um i love library objects <laughs> How many times have you set up a custom test uh, or assessment question or or a uh, for a format for a learning check and just wanted to use that same format over and over again? Um, back in the day with other tools, we used to go find that course, open that course, copy those things Hi. out, bring it in. It may or may not work, whatever. But yeah, no, you can have that whole setup um, already in, in your library and you just grab that up. And that is that is just an amazing, amazing thing. But uh, I think we're down here to the questions, uh, Steph. Yeah, we do have a question. Um, under the kind of guidelines of perceivable as part of the poor system, should the skip nav link be visible to all users? I'll respond. Um, yeah. I don't think so. Um, not in my experience, it hasn't been, because I think the primary purpose of the skip nav is really for somebody who is using a screen reader. I don't know if the mindset the philosophy has changed on that, but generally I would have a skip link at the top left corner of the page. It's the very first thing in the project or title explorer. And we link to, this is really important, we link to the page title that is the last thing before the first chapter. So it's the last thing in the title explorer or the um, project title. And the reason we do that 
the page title we have formatted as an H1. You can see in Chris's um, image here. So number one is the skip to the page title. You can call it skip, skip nav, skip link, you know, whatever. That's not a big deal. But um, link it to page title have that page title be like a dynamic page title and format it as an H1. And this is something that came out of a lot of discussions through the Lectora Accessibility User Group, the LAUG. And what we learned from our resident screen reader expert is that people who are using a screen reader rely on these headings, the semantic markup. They rely on the H1 heading to navigate web pages, therefore your course is essentially like a big long web page, they can jump from page title to page title. Once they get to the page title, everything below that is pretty much normal text. So that's why we format it the way that we do. I have heard maybe some little bit of rumblings about making it available, um, but I think when you think about it from a practical perspective, it's really not necessary to make it available because if someone is a sighted learner, they they already have the built-in equipment to skip past the buttons. They don't need it. Okay, so that would be my answer to that question. And I think I want to add a little bit more. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was on that on that HTML, the text types. Um, Again, just know that these are set up. There are six levels, basically H1 through H6. It's automatically built in. And those headings communicate, again, the organization of the content within the page. Uh, it's used a lot for web browsers, plugins, and things like that. And of course, the most important would be H1. I've done a few where I've had to use you know, my H2 and H3, but that H1, it's just for our sighted learners it's like putting it in bold and making it you know 50 point or something so if you if you practice good information design in general you will know to use your hierarchy of headers thoughtfully um the most important information on the page or the title of the page will get the age get, get the, the largest header as you subjugate information underneath that, you would say everything that now is of the second level will get the H2 header. If something falls under the H2, it should get the H3. If you do that for your sighted learners, because it is great information design and it helps them parse the chunks of information, you will have the side benefit then of when you get to the screen reader, you're also telling the screen reader what order that information should be consumed. So you're, you're, you're doing double duty there. I, I encourage everybody, thank you, Chris Paxson, for picking that up because that's exactly where I was going was along the same lines of what you're saying. It's just a lot of accessible design is just really good instructional design and information design. I want to add to that. Um, I know when I first started looking at semantic markup, I kind of was like, how do I know which heading to put first, second, third, fourth? OK, and it, it's there's not a whole lot of information out there. You know, I just kind of was fortunate enough to learn it through the, the group. But what I would say, too, is most times all you really need is the H1. You have to to look at your page content. If you've got three groups of information and you truly are presenting categories, then yes, you would extend it to an H2. And each one of those categories would be categorized as an H2. You got your page title, but you don't want like the first group to be H2, then the second one's H3, and the third one's H4. Okay. Right. Think of it like an outline. And you know, you have that mm -hmm. outline. So that's how you want to think about it. So, yeah, definitely. Exactly. And I showed a picture real quickly there of where you would find that be like under the text block under the properties mm -hmm. in that ribbon under those web options. And you'll notice that far side it says heading HTML heading type H1. Right. 
and it can it will apply that heading tag to a single text block we had some conversations in the last laug that we met when we met and i know that there's been some kind of an update made to lectora i can't remember exactly what it is maybe if somebody on the call remembers john i don't know if you if you might remember but um there some people have discovered that in that particular text box if you like click into it and highlight some text or you do something specific you can actually make it a different heading level i think or i, I know joe has made comments about we're going to look at being able to have more than one heading level inside mm -hmm. of the text box so that way you don't have to have your heading text in a text box all by itself and then the normal text in a separate text box below that so it's my understanding that, that was something that e-learning brother was going to be looking into okay yeah those are those are one of those things that um when you're working with html and, and html based tools it's one of those things that that is just kind of challenging and and as far as like dealing with text and sometimes um styling can be a little bit uh, of, of not like what you might expect from some other programs that you know that you might use for desktop publishing or some things but yeah it's definitely something Chris I know that that would be that would be exceptional if we could we would love to be able to make major improvements to text handling because we know that it, it can it's very important and it can be kind of a bugaboo. I just wanted to point out here we have a comment from Anne who I know is is an accessibility expert who says she uses the skip navigation for her keyboard users as well. And uh, mm -hmm. she says that it's hidden, but becomes visible when it gets focused. So what that means, maybe Christine, yes. maybe you want to describe what that means for getting focus. Yes, Ian, thank you for that reminder. I, I do remember that. I, I get so focused on screen reader users that I, that I don't think about the keyboard users that much. And that's just my experience you know but yes um i've also i know we've had some discussions in the group where people have talked about using javascript when um when either a mouse or a keyboard gets near a skip link that it will give it focus so chris is showing here um one of the web accessibility settings in the project options or title options depending on which version you're in is that when when someone is something is selected on the page then it's going to get a border around it and it's going to communicate with a device and to indicate that that is what is focused it is focused on okay and that's what by it it has focus so. and that and that means so like if it's if for example it's a checkbox you can tab tab and see the highlight the focus change and then when you get to the one you want to select then you can you can hit a space bar or an enter right depending on what you have set up to actually make that selection so there are a number of users um we do focus a lot focus a lot on on uh, screen readers for the assistive technology but there are a lot of users who uh do because because of various uh, uh the ways that they they use the keyboard um they use either tabbing or spacing to navigate and um this is one of the other key accessibility features that uh, is in Lectora. You can change that focus box. So if you have a dark screen, you end up with the right contrast and, and or focus indicator, I should say. And uh, I'd like to add one more thing to that, Chris. So, you know, when we all think about e-learning and where it came from and tools like Lectora, we had the web first. We all can experience focus now. Right. Filling out a form and you're tabbing, you can see either a little outline or sometimes maybe it is a colored outline, which is what Lectora makes available to us. When Trivanus owned Lectora, they started this. They came up with a way to build an e-learning tool that needed to replicate or mirror what was happening in the world of HTML. And when they did that, they came up with some tools 
that made it easier for us as developers, sort of a WYSIWYG, behind all of these things is JavaScript and a bunch of other tools. But all we have to do is press a button, okay? Yep. Still, the fundamental foundation <laughs> is how is a web page and a website developed? That's what they leverage when they put this together. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. And, and, and before I turn it over to Steph to bring us home, that also is one of the advantages of developing in Lectora because when users who use assistive technologies come to the web, the course that they hit in Lectora is going to behave the same way with the same tools that they use for their everyday lives for consuming information online. And that's extremely powerful and extremely convenient for them. So Steph, I'm afraid we're out of time now. I have to turn it over to you to bring us home. Yes, indeed. We are at the end of our time. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been really helpful. We've all learned a lot about accessibility. I think we're all very excited to dive into Lectora and try out some of these tips, which brings me to my final piece of the day, which is if you are not a Lectora user yet, you can get a free trial on our website. And I just posted that link in the chat there. If you're already a Lectora user, um, earlier I did share the links to the Lectora Accessibility Users Group and the Rockstars community, as Chris and Christine shared. Those are excellent places to connect and get your questions answered. And that is all for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Chris, Chris, Christine, John, thank you all for your time today. We really appreciate it. We hope to see everyone on our next webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.